morning, and welcome to Driving Force Radio, where we seek to discover what drives today's leaders. On today's show is Daphna Michelson, the founder and president of Journey Women for the 50 and 52 Journey. This is such a unique project. It's where Daphna took a journey across all 50 states in Washington, D.C. in just 52 weeks back in 2009. And the real goal was really to look at America's problems and to find those problem solvers and idea generators out there in the world and and capture what they were doing right. Welcome to the show, Daphna. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here, Jan. Oh, I'm so excited to finally have you here. I know our schedules never seem to go together, but well, thanks for coming Busy in. people, busy schedules. <laughs> busy people, busy schedules. So tell listeners, what is 50 and 52? So the 50 and 52 journey was my travels, as you said, to all 50 states in 2009, one state a week for 52 weeks, with the idea to seek out and find the people who were ordinary people who look like you and me, have the same amount of money and education that we have, who have answered the question of, you know, I have a problem, you might have that problem too, and they've raised their hand and said, I'm going to solve it for both of us. So these aren't people who took on to solve hunger across the globe necessarily, but right. they are people who saw someone digging in the garbage can in their own neighborhood and said, you know what, this hurts me, how do I stop that? So that, that's, that leads me to this question, you know, what, what kinds of problems are we talking about outside of somebody being hungry in their own neighborhood? What are some of those problems? What were some of the big things? Well, imagine your own neighborhood and think about the houses on your block and, the, and then the kids who go to school with your kids. Behind closed doors, we don't know what's going on in somebody's family. Mm -hmm. And when I traveled the country and I asked people, who are the people solving problems in your community? I got a lot of inside views behind those closed doors. So for example, a family in, near Atlanta, in the suburbs of Atlanta, who had three children who were growing up perfectly normally, and all of a sudden the oldest daughter stopped progressing at about the age of 12 or 13, which is very old to stop developing mentally. Right. But she stopped, and they spent years trying to discover what was wrong with her before a doctor finally said, you know what, this is who she is, love her for who she is, and try to get her treatment. Well, about that same time, their youngest son stopped developing as well. So they still don't know what the problem is, some sort of a genetic um, misfire within their children, but here you have almost mature children who have stopped developing. Well, there are very few services that look right for someone who's behaving like a 13-year-old in a 22-year-old body. Tell me you don't know people right. who do that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. so here we have people who, who actually, this is where their emotional maturity is. So the middle normal child, who of course bore all sorts of guilt for being normal, normal. Um, before he was off to college said, you know what, mom, we need to start an organization. You need to start a nonprofit. And that's how we think, right? We think automatically, let's go start a nonprofit organization. Right. And she started an organization for kids, not only like her kids, and I say kids loosely because it was the, the participants are up to 50 years old, who mm. have stopped developing at some point in their life but need social interaction and social engagement. What was happening with their oldest daughter was when she hit 22, there were no more services for her. Her life was right. bagging groceries for half a day and then sitting on the couch for the rest of her life. And she was getting depressed. It's it's not okay to live like that. And and as a as a parent or as a just as a, as a woman, I wouldn't want to live like that either. Sure. So, so mom said, I have to do something for my daughter. And in doing something for her daughter, she helped dozens in her community. And that organization that. is still going around today. And we got to meet them and see the kids that, that they have helped because they answered the question of, I have a problem. So how am I going how to solve it? How am I going to solve it? I love that. So why'd you go to all 50 states? Why didn't you just stay in your own state? I know you're based here in Colorado. Why did, what prompted you to pick all 50 states? It, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. It actually <laughs> started from a really horrible conversation. Um, I grew up without money. And my parents, who are wonderful people, who I respect and admire for everything that they did for us as children, played the lottery twice a week. And um, my mother loved to play the game of when we win the lottery, I'm going to get you this, yeah. I'm going to get you a car, you can shop at the mall. You know, and at 16 years old, these are things that you really want when you've it's never had deal. something new. You want to be able to go to Benetton, doesn't exist. <laughs> 
Uh, you want to be able to go to Benetton and, and, and buy your, your fancy, trendy sweater. Right. And every week they played, and every week we played that game, and every week they didn't win. And I started to become angry at the lottery because if my parents, who are good people, couldn't win, clearly there was a problem with the system. So at 18, I made a conscious decision that I was boycotting the lottery. I was never going to play. And I took my dollar where I knew I would get a return on its investment to the mall. So I'm in the grocery store, you know, in 2008, a single mom with two kids, finally get a boyfriend. Not easy to get a boyfriend when you're a single mom <laughs> with two little kids. So I, I you know, hoodwink this guy into dating me. We're, gro we're grocery shopping and he's like, I, I need to break a 20. The lottery is like $435 million. I'm going to go buy a lottery ticket. So I start sweating, panicking the whole nine yards. Like, oh my God, you can't buy a lottery ticket. You don't, you know, all of the <laughs> emotional issues. Yeah. I can't have a meltdown here in the middle of the grocery store. I can't lose this boyfriend. This is a really bad idea. I said to him, you know what? You buy the lottery ticket and I'll pray for you. So he buys the lottery ticket and we get into the car and he does the most awful thing. He, he says, starts the game with like your mom. What are you going to do when we win the lottery? And I'm like, God, no. I, I said, I refuse. I'm not going to play. <laughs> He's like, you have to play. And I'm like, I don't want to lose this boyfriend. I'm like, okay, I'll play the game. But you have to understand if you don't win the lottery, I'm going to dump you. Bad words. <laughs> <laughs> Should never have said this. But I'm a human being. I first completely outfitted my Porsche Cayenne hybrid. Sure. Nice. Of course, I care about the environment, you know. And uh, he asks me the next question, which changed my life. And he said, will you travel? And I guess I didn't know that I had this angst pent up in me. I really uh -huh. didn't understand it. At the time, I was in Leadership Denver, and we just finishing Leadership Denver, an entire year of spending intimate time discussing how to solve the problems in the city and county of Denver. It was a phenomenal program that opened my eyes in ways that I didn't know they weren't open already. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that I had this pent up anxiety inside of me that came out when he said, will you travel? And he asks that question and I said, yeah, I'm going to travel. You better believe I'm going to travel and I'm going to go to all 50 states and I'm going to meet with every <coughs> single governor and I'm going to ask them how they're engaging their citizens in solving community problems. Wow. Like, who says that? <laughs> I don't know. Right. It's, it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's a very unique kind of geeky is, <laughs> is how I've uh, over the years through a lot of therapy have figured out what happened there. But it just all came out. And for three hours, I talked to him about commerce and trade agreements and why aren't we working together as states and why don't we do more with New Mexico or with Kansas or with Utah you know and and, right. and and what is it that we're supposed to be doing across the country and why are these gold domes off limits to so many people who are in the communities in the neighborhoods Absolutely. and things that that I didn't understand and here we were at 2008 about to I mean all of our lives changed mm-hmm by the end of 2008. And we were already feeling it. And here in Denver, we were uniquely feeling it because we were preparing for the Democratic National Convention. It did not matter what party you were a part of. All anybody talked about was this convention, that election, and when will somebody in that White House solve our problems, whoever it was. And I was with these people in Leadership Denver who were the future leaders. They still are the future leaders of the city and county of Denver. And they were throwing up their hands in defeat. Hmm. And I said, wait a minute, we have it wrong. Somebody in that White House all the way across the country is not solving our problems here in Denver, here on Colorado Boulevard, is not where the president of, of the United States is, 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 focused. is focused. Right. And I am not anti-government. I want to make sure that that's very clear. Vote. Please vote. We need to have government officials. But when it comes to your community, when it comes to your neighborhood, when it comes behind your closed door, it is up to you and me to solve those problems. Sure. So as we were feeling that that descent into what was to come. And we didn't know what the abyss would be. We didn't know what 2009 would look right. like. We knew it would be a new president, someone who was untested no matter who got elected. Right. But we didn't know that our economy was gonna free fall. Right. But we were already losing control. And it occurred to me that if I could show examples of ordinary people, people without access to lots of money, people who didn't necessarily have access to huge Ivy League educations, Yep people who didn't have big titles. If I could show these people and how they were taking control of what was going on in their home, in their community, on their block, that it might empower others to say, I can do that too. So Daphna, how did you get started? How, how did you say, okay, I'm gonna point right here and I'm gonna start at this city. How did you get started and how did you fund this journey? Oh, I mean, it's, what an exciting how journey. How did I fund this journey? I'm still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you that to, the first start was I reached out to my mentors mm -hmm. and I asked them if I was 
crazy. And they told me without a doubt, hands down, I was nuts out of my mind. Single mom. Yeah. I had finally, you know, uh, many people may not realize it, but it's really hard still for a woman to get a mortgage and a car payment. And I had tuition payment, mortgage payment, car payment, responsibilities, and children who I love dearly. Yeah. So there, there was a lot going into this besides for the fact that I really thought that I, I was about to give something that could be a gift to our country. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot to go into it. So I talked to a lot of people and they told me I was crazy, which was, of course, fodder. It takes a little crazy to make a difference. Sure. And I put together a board of my mentors and they met in my house and we started talking about, was this realistic? Did this make sense? And could we make an impact? Because sure, I would love to be on that trivial pursuit piece of people who've traveled to all 50 states and not just landed in an airport in a state, but I did up to 800 miles in each state. I interviewed wow. 10 people all around the state. I drove three hours in Delaware. Did you know you could drive three no, hours in Delaware? No, I thought it was like an hour three anyway. Hours in no, three hours in Delaware <laughs> I drove. I mean, I was like practically in Washington, D.C. And, and the people that I met around the country just blew my mind. Right. But but I brought together those people. Everybody should have a mentor. And I had mentors from a bunch of different areas, people who were older than me, younger than me, smarter than me, um, same as me. And we sat around and we talked about, was this something that would make a difference? And when we decided that it would, and when we went and said, it's not the governors we're looking for. No. This was the big change. We wanted the ordinary people. We wanted the people that. who looked like you and me. Love that. Um, uh, Adam Schrager, who used to be a political uh, analyst for our local NBC station, was on our board. And he's the one who said, you don't want the governors. And I'll tell you, that was a hard moment for me. I wrote about it in my book. Because at that point, if you asked me what, what, what my long-term future goal was, I'm a hugely goal-oriented person, I would have told you my goal was to become the first female governor of Colorado. And I share that goal with other Col Colorado female politicians. Um, and I have not been a Colorado female politician. I've just been a community member. But that was my goal at that time. Mm -hmm. So to meet all of the governors around the country was a dream. It really was. Sure. Because I wanted to know how they thought. I wanted to learn from their mistakes. I wanted to learn from their best practices. Yeah. But that's not who would inspire the nation. Right. Real people. Real, Real people, people inspire. inspire people. Yeah. That's right. So how did you do it as a single mom? Obviously, you had two little kids because this was back in 2009 when this journey started. Right. So they and were six and seven. Young. Yeah. <laughs> how do you do this as a single parent? Because I think so many, so many moms are out there just trying to figure out how they juggle work and and community efforts plus doing what they their kids need done how did you do that it it was um it was a logistical challenge that was made easier by the fact that they have a participating father so i traveled only on the days they were with their dad and so definitely made the trip a lot more expensive because i wasn't able to just say okay january 1st has come i am on the road um, i had to come back every week so this is what my year looked like Every, every, Mon or every Wednesday, I dropped the kids off to school, ran to the airport, got in a plane, landed in a city, got into a rental car, did 800 miles, got back to the airport on Friday morning, got back to Denver by Friday afternoon to pick up the kids from school or camp. And I did that every week for 52 weeks. Now, oh a couple gosh. of the weeks when the kids stayed with their dad for the weekend, I would do larger states like Texas or California where there would be extended amounts of driving and I might need the weekend. Although we figured out um, I didn't sleep very much and and probably was slightly dangerous on the road because I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we figured out I could do most states, including California, I did in four days as opposed to five days. Oh so, and on the days that I was home, I was mommy. So I actually, for the very first time in my life, I have always worked, I've worked since I'm 14 years old. For the very first time in my life, I was able to pick up the kids at pickup, at dismissal. I was able to get into that carpool lane. And you know, I would have laughed at myself when I was 20 if I could have ever thought that something like as simple as being in the carpool lane would make me cry. Because sure. you know what? For the first time, I could do it. I was able to go to my daughter's Girl Scout meeting and teach them how to sew buttons. And it was funny because I had done a talk that day. So I was wearing a leopard skin jacket and a black leather skirt and black spike heels, I recall. And I walked in and I thought, I don't look like your ordinary Girl Scout mom today. <laughs> <laughs> this was not the best outfit for, <laughs> for teaching the girls how to sew buttons. But here I was being yeah. able to do something as simple as sew buttons. It was an exhausting year. It was definitely sure. um, a nonstop journey. 
but my life changed not because of the people that I met solely. It changed when my children got into my car and said to me, Mommy, you're my hero. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, they talked about me everywhere. We would go out, we would be standing at the host stand at California Pizza Kitchen, and my son would say to the host, do you know who my mom is? My mom is 50 and 52 Journey. You need to check out her website, 50and52journey.com. Oh, I love that. Yeah, and when we, um, he makes me cry, I'm sorry. They both make me cry. When we, and I'm not apologizing for crying. Um, <laughs> when we um, came to Colorado, my children nominated places that I should go. So my children, um, my son's teacher was friends with the owner of Same Cafe. Mm -hmm. So when he was in kindergarten, they took a trip to Same Cafe and it, and it stuck with him. And if you don't know Same Cafe, Same stands for So All May Eat. And it's on uh, Colfax and Vine in Denver. And they are a model for the nation at this point of, of restaurants that have a pay what you will. The community mm -hmm. kitchen sort of approach. Right, but, they're, but they wanted to do something where women and children would feel comfortable. Because mm -hmm. in your ordinary community kitchen where they volunteer, they were both, he, she was a teacher and he was a, he was a computer guy. Um, and they volunteered in soup kitchens where children and, and women are largely absent because it's not safe for them. They don't feel comfortable sure. and the food is not the quality they would, they would serve, serve their, their children. Kids. So here is an opportunity to feel dignity, to take your kids out for dinner when maybe you don't have anything. Well, my son never forgot that, and he selected Same Cafe for my Colorado interview. So being a parent wow. through this journey was made it all the more um, powerful for me. I will tell you that when we were covered on local news media, the feedback from other moms was very negative. They, really? Absolutely. It shocked me. They um, went online and commented on the pieces. What is she letting her children run wild, eating junk food and blah, blah, blah. And, and it surprised me that there was that kind of a visceral response from other moms. But I think it's just a lack of understanding. Or, of what uh, you were or, doing and what right. you were accomplishing. But also, we have been told and we keep getting told, and even as recently as today, that we can't have everything that we want. That we have to sacrifice everything for our children. And maybe there is a way to come up with that balance. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to get divorced <laughs> right. and, and have, and have a, 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 another partner who's taking sole responsibility on a couple days of the week, but there might be some answers. Yeah. And when you do follow those passions and desires, you change the imprint of your children's futures because they understand that they too have capacity to go after whatever it is they believe in. Yeah, and make their own difference wherever it's at. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. So I have to ask you, you know, you talked about that, that moms around, especially here in the Denver Metro, sort of had this very visceral, um, direct approach. What, what was the message you got from the people that were out there in the country that you met? That was actually, I'm glad you asked that question. People don't ask that question. The response that I got from the people that I met was hugely, almost like they felt relief that somebody was coming to see who they were. I mean, I was in a place in Montana that's designated frontier land, right? So mm -hmm. rural is, is a, a designation where I think you have 5,000 people in a particular geographic area. Frontier is where you have 250 <laughs> it, within, you know, some 25 miles. So oh, wow. we're, we're talking about parts of this. Uh, that's not exact. Somebody please look it right. up and, and don't quote me. Um, but we're, we're talking about people in America who don't get paid attention to and who are solving their own problems in their own communities just the same way as we are in the city of Denver where you have a million people running around. Right, right. And when I would come to them at the, by the first, by the fourth week or fifth week, I already had a track record. And I, I teach at Metro and we, we talk about, um, how to use the internet to share your story. And I talk a lot about having a mission and that if you state that mission, people will feel more comfortable speaking with you. Well, I had a very clear stated mission and a promise that I would not say one negative word in 2009. I was not going around this country to point out the problems. I was not going around the country to say, oh God, look at this back, backwards hillbilly or look at this stuck up city person. That was not my, my mission. My mission was to show you the positive things that were going on in this country, to be an antidote to the news. We watch the news and the news, and, and I have lots of friends who are very uh, responsible journalists, but the job of the, the news is to tell you yeah. what's extreme that's going on. 
And it's important that we know, we need to know what's going on. But if you watch the news solely and believe that that is your entire environment, fires, murders, rapes, why get up in the morning? Absolutely. When I got to Mississippi in particular, there was one young man who reached out to me and he hadn't done his research, right? Most people had done their research and they were welcoming, they were excited that I was coming. Well, he sent me an email and he said, you better not say one negative word about Mississippi because huh. we have enough. We've had enough. And I went to meet him, still friends with him today. His name is Cyrus Webb. And here is a young man who had tried to commit suicide three times before he was 21. Oh. His third time, he was still in the hospital from his prior attempt. And when oh he didn't gosh. succeed, he said, you know what, maybe I'm not supposed to die. But here is a kid who grew up in Mississippi where the news told him he was gonna be dead by his 20s anyway. He was gonna be in a gang, he was gonna be doing drugs, he was going to commit, co uh, 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 commit, commit some kind of a violent crime. Mm -hmm. And that was his future. And here is a kid who loved to read, very active Republican, he didn't look like the people who were around him. Right. And he didn't know what to do. And when he had that third attempt, he said, you know what? I love to read and people around me don't. His parents understood it and recognized him and got him books. I mean, he I was lucky. But he tried to find a book club. Well, guess what? In Mississippi, they didn't allow men in book clubs. So he couldn't come more than <laughs> twice because twice made him a member. And you couldn't be a member of a book club if you were a male in Mississippi. Huh. So he started his own book club, Conversations Book Club. He now has a magazine and a radio show, some million subscribers to his radio wow. show, uh, some 400,000, I think he's about what he's hitting on his magazine. And he started the conversation around literacy and that you don't have to be a geek. He started right. hip hop and books as one of his things. And he gets the actual authors, the hip hop stars who are writing these books, and they do, the hip hop stars write books. Yeah. And they come and talk to his group. I love that. He changed the conversation. And he changed the conversation in, 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 in an area where it's so critical right now. So critical. So critical for and those next And he reached steps. out to me and said, you don't say one negative thing about Mississippi. And I reached back and say, I don't say one negative thing about America. Yeah. So let me come and talk to you. And so I came and I talked to him and we we're able to share. And, and, he's, and he hooked me up around Mississippi too. Fabulous stories of incredible people, ordinary people, people just like you and me, changing the way that America looks by answering the question of, I have a problem and how do I solve do I it? it and who else do I help along the way? I love that. So you talked about it, just touched on it for just a second. How did you find these people to interview? I'm imagining, you know, back then it was, the internet was really start, sort of starting, but social media was sort of really gaining some traction too. How did you find all these people in these states? Well. As, as you know, it was social media, um, and it's interesting. I, I, I think about if I had done my journey today, oh my goodness, <laughs> how much stronger would it be because of how many of us there are on social media. Um, so it was late 2008, and I didn't know anything. I didn't even know the word Facebook, let's be fair. Um, Twitter hadn't exploded yet. Twitter exploded, uh, if you recall, after the horrible incidents in Mumbai. There was a terrorist attack in Mumbai, and people were tweeting the, the hostages, unfortunately, some of whom perished, were tweeting their locations. And all of a sudden, people were getting news before the Associated Press could get it out to the rest right. of us. And that's when Twitter exploded. But that was already January of 2009. I was already on the road. So Twitter is just gaining traction. I had to learn Facebook and I hated it. I hated it. I banged my head against the computer every day for three weeks and I said to my <laughs> husband, this is the stupidest, oh, he wasn't my husband, he was my boyfriend. This is the stupidest thing ever. And then of course, my high school crush found me on Facebook and friended me and well, you know, he's married and has lots of children, but oh my goodness, my high school crush right. found me on Facebook and all of a sudden I was sold. And he was popular in high school still remains popular and so all of the sudden all of these other friends who were connected to him found me and friended me on facebook well i grew up in cincinnati ohio and for better or worse it was a wonderful place to grow up but everybody scattered sure all of a sudden i had a nationwide network overnight just because that one friend friended, friended me you. 
And then I understood the power of Facebook. And then I understood how to utilize it. So everywhere I would go, I would post on Facebook or I would post on Twitter. Next week, I'm going to be in Ohio. Next week, I'm going to be in California. Next week, I'm going to be in Iowa. Please tell me the people who are solving problems in your community. I love that. Now, at the beginning, it was really hard, right? Sure. My first date was Delaware. And <laughs> I didn't understand the rules. I got kicked off of Gmail for spamming. I got kicked off of Facebook for spamming because there are rules. And I had gone on every single Delaware group page on Facebook and reached out to every administrator and they locked me out for three days, which was oh, at that no. point, I didn't have three days to be locked out. And, and I, I'll never forget, I'm on 17th in Colorado, which is a very major intersection in Denver. It's pouring rain and I'm sitting behind a car that has Delaware plates. I kid you not, I got out of my car and knocked on their window. And the girl like cracks it open a little bit and I threw my business card and I'm like, I'm traveling to Delaware next week. I need to interview people who are solving community problems. Can you give me a connection? Of course, she never emailed me because I'm a wackadoodle. <laughs> I love that. But that's, you know, what I had to do. But ultimately, it started gaining momentum and my blog was getting 100,000 hits. Wow. So, so people were starting to hear the word and social media became yeah. a very effective tool. Effective tool. Well, as you said, it, it, it takes a little crazy to make a difference. And, and obviously, you're well on your way in the journey. When we come back, we'll have more with Thoughtna Michelson. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Driving Force Radio, where we seek to discover what drives today's leaders. On our show today is Daphna Michelson, who led the 50 and 52 journey um, in the course of 2008 and 2009. And, and it's such a cool project because you went to all 50 states in 52 weeks and, and interviewed the common person about problem solving and, and how they were getting it right, how they were moving the needle positively in their communities. Mm -hmm. Just the everyday person, not a politician, not a millionaire, not well, well actually jan are there millionaires uh, yeah i actually one billionaire quite wow. frankly um I, I interviewed people from all walks of life including politicians i interviewed people from age 14 to age 91 a huge plethora of religions and races and socioeconomic backgrounds from recently homeless to multi-billionaire and everywhere wow. in between because it, it is about all of us. I actually tell people, I dare you to go to my website and not find someone who looks like you, sounds like you, or has the same amount of money and education as you, who is making a difference in their lives and thereby affecting their community. Sure. So where do people find the website, Tafna? The All of the videos from my journey are available at 50in52journey.com. That's 5-O-I-N-5-2-J-O-U-R-N-E-Y.com. Or you can go to DaphnaM.com and click on the logo, which is a little <laughs> chick with a backpack. My chick with a backpack, because that, that was me, chick yeah. with a backpack all around the country. Absolutely. Um, and and there, there, are, there are 375 videos of the 500 people that I interviewed I on that. that website. So you can see for yourself. And, and look, I'm, I'm, I was a woman with a camera without any sort of training on how to use a camera. Uh, there, you can hear them, you can see them, but it's not any kind of glorious video. But for 10 minutes, you can sit and watch somebody tell you the story about how they're changing their lives and, and impacting the that. people around them. And they look like you. I and love they look that. like me. I love that. And, and you know, as you did this journey and as you got out there and really started putting it out there, you received a ton of national attention and local attention. And you were on CBS Sunday Morning and NPR and CNN, but you were also here in the Denver Post and 5280 and things like that. Talk about how that media coverage sort of helped or hindered the journey that you were on. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, so most of the, the media attention came towards the end. Mm -hmm. I, I, I almost feel like they were watching to see if it could be if done it or if I could make it or if we could get there. Um, and interestingly, there were a couple of other similar types of journeys that started about the time that I started receiving national attention. A couple of other similar journeys came up uh, uh, on, the, on the national scene because people understood, you know what, it is doable. You could yeah. actually do it. Um, Denver Post covered the story in October. It was my sister's birthday. 
And I couldn't believe it. I got a call. I, I knew, obviously, I knew they had done the article because they sat down with me and interviewed me. I didn't know when it was going to run. And so I got a call at 6 o'clock in the morning from my former secretary at Denver Health. And she's like, you're on the cover of the Denver Post. And I'm like, I'm on the cover of the Denver Post? So I'm thinking, awesome. I'm, I'm, maybe, maybe I'm on the cover of a section. Right. No, you're on the cover of the Denver Post. The cover there. And I grabbed my kids and I put them in the car because it was a day that I was home and I had to get them to school. And, and there was snow. I remember there was snow and I'm, I'm trying to fight with the, um, I never use a newspaper dispenser, but I didn't get delivery <laughs> of the Denver Post. And so I'm putting quarters in and I can't get it to open. I'm fighting with it. But sure enough, there's my picture on the front above the fold, which apparently is a big deal it's if big you deal. kill somebody, right? Absolutely. And my parents were like <laughs> thrilled. And um, I, I, it was an incredible article about the journey and really talked that. about all of the people that I met. By 12 o'clock that day, that afternoon, I had an email from CBS and they had talked about the evening news with Katie Couric. And I was like, oh, Katie Couric, I love Katie Couric. And then they came back and they said, no, I think it's going to be Sunday morning. Now, granted, Sunday morning is a very, very huge deal. Right. And I was like, Katie Couric, I wanted Katie Couric. <laughs> CBS Sunday morning came with me. They traveled with me to Arizona oh. and it was the most incredible experience. What happened is Barry Peterson, the journalist who did the story, lives in Denver now, and he had seen that piece. And he said, I want to know more. And they did such an incredible job coming with me, but being in the background to, sh to share the story. And they went and traveled to four of the other states that I had visited and gathered the stories in the way that I couldn't do it because I didn't have resources. They got what's called B-roll, right? right? I, B-roll wasn't within my budget. You asked me in the prior segment how I funded this and I skirted that question because it's an embarrassing answer. You know, I, I, I spent 15 years in fundraising. My, my entire background was nonprofit uh, with a little stint of my own stationary business mm -hmm. years ago. And um, I knew that I could fundraise for this journey, but no one could fundraise when the bottom collapsed. Yeah, when the markets were falling apart. And at this point, I, I have a big... Um, I don't complain about a problem unless I'm willing to work on the solution. So I had been complaining and complaining and complaining. And now I didn't have any money. And now things were getting really tough. And my mentors said to me, stop. They actually, one of them said, get on your hands and knees and crawl back to Denver Health and beg for your job back. And I said, what? Now that it's really hard, I have to turn around and say no? And I didn't know what the answer was. Right. And ultimately, um, fortunately, I had been given very good advice when I first started working. And I had been putting away money in my 401k since I was about 22 years old. Mm -hmm. And while there wasn't a significant amount of money in there, there was enough to get me started. And ultimately, I used my 401k. And, wow. I, and I got donations from other people. And uh, small, though they may be, but they got me along the way. But they helped. My um, then boyfriend, now husband, ended up cashing in his savings as well to help keep it going. Really? We, we believed in what we were doing. We believed in it enough. And when CBS Sunday Morning came and wanted to share that story, my father is a financial planner and they put that <laughs> bit on the news. And <laughs> many of my father's clients called them and said, your own daughter liquidates her 401k? How did you let that happen? Right, right. <laughs> Especially at that time. Right. So the, the, the national attention had, had multiple facets to to um, to the story, we we had the typical response. We got reached out to by um, two Hollywood filmmakers, um, one who was a producer at Extreme Makeover Home Edition, uh -huh. and the other one who was in another area. And we 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 started talking to this producer from Extreme Makeover Home Edition and talked about doing a reality show based on the journey, which wow. would have continued the work. And unfortunately, she died tragically. She had an aneurysm oh. at 40, 40 years old and she passed and I'll tell you I was very uncomfortable I didn't understand it I don't watch TV um, and so the the reality shows I know that they have changed and they have grown and I have watched Extreme Makeover Home Edition which is why I trusted her but when when she passed and that conversation came to an abrupt halt we, we didn't go didn't. forward with it anymore yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I didn't understand how to negotiate it and go forth with sure. it and quite frankly at that time we discovered I had lumps in each of my breasts. So my life took a different turn sure. 
but on the positive end, it connected me with organizations where my, my work could make a difference, such as the Random Acts of Kindness Foundation, who is located in Denver. And I was able to continue my work while going through my own um, mastectomies and recoveries and surgeries that followed the journey right. and didn't make it come to an abrupt halt. And that was because of the national attention. So Daphne, now I have to ask you this. Obviously, you learned a ton about yourself on this journey and, and what, the strength that you had and the strength of your children and the joy of it all and, and the joy of, of being out there on the road and learning from folks. What did you learn from our country? What did you learn about our country while you were on the journey? So much. Uh, I, I have to tell you, growing up, every time I thought about travel that I wanted to do, it was always international. Mm -hmm. It was the Middle East. It was Europe. It was uh, the Mediterranean. It, it wasn't Iowa. Um, and when I started traveling the country, I learned exactly how beautiful our country is. And that while we all look to Europe for that age old beauty, we have it right here in America. Mm -hmm. And it's not only in the unbelievable colors of our mountains, Wyoming, every different highway you take has a different scenescape. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you want to see the beauty of our country. All you have to do is travel Wyoming travel every highway in Wyoming and you will see the vast array of the beauty of our country. But it's also the people. And, and I learned that, you know, we come from the pioneers. And, and I, I have such a hard time now talking about the pioneers because I had an opportunity to meet with many Native Americans who suffered. And um, so I say this with all deference to my Native American friends who lost family and lost land and lost yeah. dignities. But we are from the pioneers. And the pioneers who came and settled this country understood one thing, that in order to succeed, we not only had to help ourselves, but we had to help our fellow neighbor. I not only have to build my barn, but I have to help you build your barn. Right. And then together we build the church and the schoolhouse. It was the foundation upon which we were built. And I, my epiphany was I was in the 16th state for me, which was um, South Dakota. And I was having my very first interview with somebody who still owned and operated the land their family homesteaded. Wow. And I thought this was a huge deal. I was so excited about it. And I said it to somebody in South Dakota and they kind of looked at me funny and they said, yeah, most land that was homesteaded is still owned and operated by the families that homesteaded. I'm like, oh, this is another city girl moment. I had many yeah. of those along the way. But it was that, that moment that brought me to that realization that it's not any different today. Mm -hmm. There is one simple answer to how we get out of the economic crisis that we're in. What is it? I not only build my business, but I support your business. And together we build the community center. That's it. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the time where we are back to pioneering. Plain and simple. There are so many of us who are struggling. So many of us who don't look like we are struggling are struggling to put food on the table, Absolutely. to get our kids the education that we need, are drowning in whatever it is that, that we might have knowingly or unknowingly accepted as debts. Mm -hmm. But the answer is in ourselves. And, and I, don't, I mean this as no political statement, and I hope it doesn't come out as sounding like one. But when we are in tune with what it is that we want, and we have the supports we need to get there, we can support ourselves and each other. Mm -hmm. So if, if that answer is, I have always dreamed about owning a coffee truck, food trucks, the biggest deal in the world. Mm -hmm. How do we find the help that we need and the support we need? Because when we put that truck on the road and you come and, and buy coffee from my truck, I can turn around and come to your dress shop and buy a dress. Yep. And then we are both buoyed up. So we are back at that point where we were as pioneers, where we need to build our houses and our farms together. I, I love that analogy. I love that. And, that. and it's so wise as we head into this election season and at this time that we're in right now. And it's it's something we all as Americans need to, to be thinking about. You know, you have a ton of materials. You talked about your website and and the videos and the, the documentation that you did. What are you doing with all that stuff that you gained during the journey? I know there's some, uh, I can't think of the word, 
uh, workshops, and workshops, books and, and lesson stuff plans. Like that. What are you doing well, with all of that? Well, I, you know, th this is my uh, my my very exciting um, manuscript of my book. I love that. <laughs> I can't wait to read. <laughs> which, which has been a long time in coming because I had that break in the middle to to deal with to my heal. medical to heal. My, yeah, and 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 to heal from the journey, um, which is a bit about in in the book. But I've been so fortunate to be able to create lesson plans and workshops that have I've done around the world. I've done them in England, I've done them in Ireland, and I've done them all around the United States, where we come together and identify the challenges we are facing as a community. So sometimes that community might look like a faculty of a school. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that community is a homeowners association group. Sometimes that community is a group of teenagers who are from disparate parts of a community but want to work together. And we come together and I don't believe that I can come to any community anywhere, not even my own, and tell people what they are suffering from. Right. But they can tell me. Yes. And, and even if they don't know it, they have it within them. So we can pull it out and put it on the table and develop an action plan and take action. It is a very fast process, and I have done it with kids as young as five, where wow. they come together and say, I understand what my community is and what my community needs, and I am the one who can solve that problem. When I work in schools and through the Random Acts of Kindness Foundation, I, have, I had the opportunity to work in many schools, including the Jefferson County School District, which is one of the largest school districts in the United States. Mm -hmm. I believe it's number six. I'm, I'm, I'm not certain about that. Um, but I was able to work with these kids ranging from kids, uh, ranging from a school that's close to 90% free and reduced lunch to a charter school that is more in the middle class, maybe one or 2% free and reduced lunch, which is our, our way of gauging what the economic uh, stability of the students are. Right. So it didn't matter where they fell across the spectrum. They were able to come up and feel empowered to say, this is my community, this is how I define my community, and this is how I want my community to be a kinder place mm -hmm. by standing up and solving a problem that was in it for me. Um, I had two really pivotal moments in bringing these yeah. community lessons. One was I was with a fourth grade group up in a mountain school and um, at the time, my daughter was in fourth grade as well. So I love to tell the kids, not only am I here to he listen to you because I'm not gonna tell you anything, but I'm, I'm a mom. I'm a mom, like you guys have moms. And I have a kid who's the exact same age as you. So like, I can totally understand your speak, <laughs> right? Yeah. So right? So kind of getting, getting to the point where they understand that, that I get them. Yeah. And we're going through this activity where they have identified, I have this anti-group think activity, which enables even the quietest kid to be able to participate, or even a kid who's unable to communicate themselves, but could have an aide who can take dictation or whatever. So a way to get all of the opinions on the table. And we go through and look at all of these ideas and thoughts and the, the, the energy in the room was palpable. The kids were totally engaged. And when I say kids, I'm talking 75. So think wow. about me. Not tiny, but you know, I'm just a woman. And 75 fourth graders sitting in front of me. Sure. And one of the kids jumps up in such excitement when I asked the question, what does this sound like to you? And they said, this sounds like adult speaking. And I mean, like I could have paid him. That's exactly what I was looking for. And I said, that's right. Your words sound like adult words. So when you communicate these words about what you want in your community, Adults will hear you talking like an adult sure. because your words are just as powerful as any adult words. And then I picked up the next line of sticky notes. And the question I had asked them was, what are the challenges facing your community or opportunities being missed? Well, unfortunately, about 25% of the kids had indicated that the choking game was a challenge facing their community. And hmm. the choking game is a potentially fatal game where the kids use a belt yeah. to choke themselves and they get a high just before they asphyxiate. Now, if you're with somebody, they can then release the belt. If you're alone, you die. And we had had deaths in Colorado that school year oh, gosh. based on the choking game. And I'm a mom of a fourth grader who hasn't discussed the choking game with her child because she didn't believe D or that didn't that know that the choking game was even an issue in fourth grade, in fourth grade, right in an affluent community. Sure. And I stopped and I said, you know what, guys, I have to stop here for a minute because I'm a mom and, and this is extremely important. You just told me that these are your words, not mine. 
that these are adult words, not kid words. So when you write down that the choking game is a problem facing your community, you do not want it to happen anymore. And if this many people have indicated that they don't want it happening anymore, how many of you thought about it but didn't write it down? You are telling me you don't yeah. want this anymore. We are not telling you not to do it. Well, for a child, that's really powerful. Right. And we know, because this is several school years ago, that they didn't have an incident anymore. At least not one that went reported, not wow. one that happened at school. That is powerful. Because it was their words. It's their work and their words. And that's what's powerful about this. I don't care how old you are. Right. When I worked with the group in Ireland, I did it via Skype and it was really exciting because they didn't have enough money to bring me in. And Skype is an incredibly powerful tool. Yep. I was in the room with them. And they were able to come up with their own solutions and their own community answers that were just as powerful. And sometimes it takes somebody to give you permission to say, you know what, you know the answer and you know the solution and you have the permission to do it. One mm. of the things that the people I met around this country did not wait for is permission. permission. So Daphne, you've taken all of this wisdom and all of this work and, and brought it across a variety of different spectrums, if you will. And I know that you've curated several TEDx events and, and things like that through here in Colorado and been part of it um, nationally. Talk about that. Tell listeners about some of this work and, and what they can do to get engaged in their communities. Well, TED is an incredible movement, an incredible movement. If you haven't checked out videos, go to TED.com and just spend a month on their YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And there's also a TEDx YouTube channel. So a TEDx is an independently operated TED event. So TED are the big, you know, mainstream mama, Bill Gates kind of right. events. And then TEDx are your events around the, the country, around the world, excuse me, around the world where you have a little bit of control over what it is that you're sharing. Well, I had been invited to speak at a TEDx ed event. So a TEDx, um, event focused on education about how I brought my materials into the classroom. And when I got access to this TEDx event and when I was invited to participate as a presenter, I became really excited when I realized the capacity for bringing conversation in a whole new realm. TED's motto is ideas worth sharing and my work is about ideas worth sharing. So right. for me, there was, was a huge amount of synergy. Um, TEDx Mile High existed in our community, but the first TEDx Mile High event brought people, huge name speakers from all around the country. And I thought, I want to do something that's more on a local spectrum. I also wanted more females on the stage. So I applied for a license for TEDx Crestmore Park. You have to name it after an area, and Crestmore Park is, is a beautiful area near the venue uh, where we were going to hold our event. And so, and it didn't have any, right, people wouldn't necessarily identify that it's only for a particular community with right. the Crestmore Park name. So we, we branded under, under that name, and we had the opportunity to bring together a very diverse group of presenters from around the Rocky Mountain region, primarily from Denver and, and the mountains and the Denver metro area and the mountains to empower people right here at home with others from right here at home. Um, our our subcategory is breaking boundaries, building community to elevate, empower, and engage each other. And we created this, uh, it was really awesome, a human board game where you went around the room and engaged with each other and coming up with your own ideas yeah, and removing your own boundaries. And giving that, what, we, what I learned from the journey is, ultimately you needed to have some sort of a cheerleading section to help you <laughs> along the way. Because that making, is so true. making change is isolation. You yeah. lose friends. I lost friends when I did the journey. You wouldn't think that, but I lost friends and they've come, they've come back around since, but sure. there, there are many people who can't understand when you leave a desk job with a regular check, especially when you have children's, a mortgage and tuition to pay. So there, there, there are definitely a lot of risks that you take that are personal and social, but when you believe in something enough that you want to do it, sure. you need to have that team around you. So we tried to create that in our TEDx events. Um, and then the, the most incredible thing from TED that came out of the Paley Center was TEDx Women or TED Women. And that was really the answer that I was looking sure. for. Uh, I love to work with women. It's my, my personal 
my personal thing, and it has been well before the journey. I was president locally of an organization called Hadassah, which has 1,300 women in Denver and 300,000 members around the United States. And it's very much about lobbying for um, education and, and medical technology for women and supports a hospital in Israel that was nominated for the Nobel Treatment or for the, for the Nobel Prize for Equal Treatment of All People in a War-Torn Country. country. And, and I support this organization because of the founder, Henrietta Zold, who was a woman who had a problem that she went out and solved and has, and, and, and has transformed into a worldwide movement. Absolutely. So women has always been my special focus area. So when right. the TEDx Women brand came around, we did TEDx Crestmore Park Women. And it gave us an opportunity to again reach out to, to people to share ideas and focus on what are some of the ideas that impact and affect women. Mm -hmm. Well, as a woman, as a single mom at the time of, of making my big journey, um, I started to realize where I was being pulled in multiple directions and why it wasn't possible or was it possible to yeah. have that balance of being mom and also following my passions and my dreams. So with the TEDx Women event, we tried to create a way for uh, a new way for meeting. Yeah, because talk about that quickly. Meetings are, are, are awful. awful, terrible. We don't have time. We sit around and talk about things that need to get done, and then we never do them. Right. So how do we change how that do we conversation? Change the so we created a whole series of Google documents so that everybody had access to them, of initiatives that had to be done, met, or nixed before the meeting, and we met entirely via Google Hangout. So it meant you could be in your bedroom, in your bar, in your children's nursery. You could be nursing, you could be teaching, you could be doing whatever you wanted at the time of the Love meeting, that. and then stepped out for the 30 minutes that we were gonna meet via Hangout and give your update on the Google documents that we all shared so we all knew what was going on. And if we couldn't come to the meeting, we could put our answers into the Google document. Oh, I love that. And we have a legacy of minutes that didn't need to be typed after a meeting. Because you've already done it. Everything's there. And well, it, how brilliant it, is that? It's still a process, but there are ways to meet. There are ways to engage women, and there are ways to get their story on the stage. Well, and we're going to have to go here in a second, but I know the book's on the horizon soon. What, when, when can we expect it? When can we really see well, or I, read I, the story? I promised my children that I would be done my edits by the end of September. It's September 10th. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So uh, it came to the promising of the children. So we, we are very close to handing it over to um, a publisher slash editor. And uh, we'll see what that process is going to look like. We're creating something that's more than just a book. Yeah. Um, so uh, it will be a book in book form. But the electronic book is going to link back to actual blog entries from the time of the journey, the videos that, that are relevant that's in awesome. that section of the book. So we understand that reading is an entirely new interactive process and you'll be able to the electronic version of this book will enable you to reach out to the people that I'm telling you about yep. watch their videos engage with the actual blog content and give the, your own input in real time in a book imagine Daphne, that I, I love that you are always pushing the needle that you're out there elevating empowering and engaging everyone across Thank the you. spectrum how can listeners Con connect with you or, or learn about any of the work that you're doing. Check out my website, dafnam.com, D-A-F-N-A-M.com. And right on that website, on that web page is kind of the, the dumping ground for all of my work as I continue to, to grow and communicate in different ways. And it will link you to the various things that I do as well as all of my contact information is right there on the page. So dafnam.com, D-A-F-N-A-M.com or 50and52journey.com. That's 50and5252journey.com. Thank you so much for Thank being you. with us and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for being with us here at Driving Force Radio. <laughs>